A big well, looks like you come to the screen. A big welcome to everyone who's watching on YouTube and not with us live on Twitch. But thank you for tuning in. We're going to watch together the Spring Split Finals. Oh, it was an exciting finals, and it still is, because I have yet to see the results. I have yet to be spoiled. This screen that we were just on, this is as far as I have seen. All I know is that it went to a game five, because unfortunately it, in the catalog it shows how many games it goes to. But, but we're okay with that, that's fine. That's great. Luckily it went to a game five, so we, we won't know the end of the uh, results until the actual game five. And we're going to go ahead and watch each of those games. I don't know, again, if, bring, bring it back to me. Bring it back to me. I don't know if you can tell, but... From my poorly drawn logos on both sides of my face, I'm excited for C9 and TSM. I I am hyped up. This is going to be a great. These are two of the most iconic teams from North America, and they made it to the finals. And we're going to have one hell of a finals to review. So without any further ado, let's jump right into the NA finals. Uh, if we have time today, we'll also review the European finals. Uh, but we're going to have to cut the stream a little early today, so we'll see how far we can make it through. Let's hop a little bit ahead here. Alright, so looking at the band so far, Rengar, Ash, and Rumble on Cloud9's side. Uh, Rumble's something that's still, uh, it's going to be nerfed uh, slightly in an upcoming patch, but in the patch they're playing on patch 7.6. It's still quite strong and it brings a lot of flexibility into that top lane by bringing an AP threat who does a lot of AoE magic damage to the enemy team. So knocking that out kind of restricts the champion pool as it is right now to maybe something like a Riven that could be more aggressive um, or a Camille or a Fiora kind of thing. Um, or your traditional sort of tank top laners that don't bring much of the damage but they do bring some good engage, some good CC some good peel and on the right uh, on TSM side here we see that Shen, LeBlanc and Graves are banned out those are also just big power picks Shen again still hasn't been changed in this patch yet so he can still start ulting and get the maximum shield to get a really strong engage he's a huge split pushing threat because of the double globals if you take teleport on him with his ultimate and LeBlanc just very strong Graves just very strong again these are all really good uh, bands for both sides. Wouldn't expect anything less. Very standard bands at first. These bands might evolve going forward into the games. But right now this is pretty straightforward. Looking here uh, at the picks so far. So we see Lulu coming out. That is a flexible pick between mid and support. I don't see Lulu mid as frequently in North America as we do in some of the other regions like Korea and China. Um, so I, I am expecting that to be more of a Lulu support. But this is a champion that has in the past even been, been flexed up the top lane. So Lulu is pretty not revealing, especially with these following up picks of Kennen. Uh, again, Kennen AD is frequently with being chosen now. So we're expecting him to be in the bot lane. But he traditionally has been a top laner until... The AP ratios on him got changed. So again, a possibly flexible pick there. So not much is being revealed at this point. So these bands are going to have to be um, kind of specified. And we're looking at the bands, and it seems like, yeah, they're, they're banning out some more bot lane champions to sort of try and pressure this cannon to have to be going into that bot lane and sneaky picking that up, even though they might have been wanting to flex it in the top lane for Ray. We see another top lane band coming out in Renekton. So again, that sort of leans towards this Kennen being in that top lane, because if they're going to have to pick out a top lane too, they're less likely to ban out that champion pool. Syndra, neither side has picked a mid yet. Again, Karma could be flex mid, Lulu could be flex mid, but again, in North America, those are almost always support, so we're expecting the two bot lanes uh, to be mostly filled out at this point. Again, the cannon very flexible. I'm interested to see where it goes because you can do the on-hit cannon in the top lane as well. Depends on what we see as the matchup. Junglers, of course, Lee Sin and Ivern already taken out. Orion are going to be the last band coming out here. And then we see locked in is going to be the Camille. That's going to be a Camille top. Again, almost certainly. Uh, Camille's support has really uh, dropped off quite quite a lot since they changed the duration of her ultimate. Bringing that isolation CC was really what made Camille's support 
um, a thing. It's that utility that that really brought to make sure in the end game team fights that somebody just couldn't retreat and without that she's not very good in the support role in my opinion i think the numbers reflect that as well though so almost certainly going to be camille in the top lane we see the lucian picked up so that is indeed going to be a cannon in the top lane again still most likely going to be on hit cannon very unlikely he's going to go ap just because that's with the numbers changes i actually still prefer ap cannon personally but it's almost never seen in competitive pro play anymore. Um, and we're going to see that that is the Cassiopeia locked into round that out. So you're going to have probably the more on-hit Kennen who can bring out the engage using his ultimate when he dashes on in. Lulu can back him up with a speed up to make sure that uh, he actually gets his ultimate off on as many people as possible during the engage. And can survive it with his shield and Lulu's ultimate. So that's a really strong engage tool. Lee Sin can follow that up really easily, get a nice flash ult um, to insect somebody out of position. And then Lucian and Cassiopeia are going to be able to destroy them. <laughs> Cassiopeia being the only source, again, assuming this is on hit cannon, being the only real source of magical damage this game, uh, is going to be able to stay away in the back line and just melt anyone who comes near. Lucian, who's going to be a bit more in the mid-range and dashing around. But we haven't talked about this last pick yet, which is the Talia. Oh, I'm so excited. I love seeing Talia when she ults in with that wall. There, there's so many ways she can use her wall. It's just, I, I get excited about champions that are very flexible. And Talia is one of those champions that has a lot of flexibility. So I'm excited to see... Uh, how uh, Bjergsen uses her. I know he's been playing her on stream too uh, recently, so he's definitely got a lot of practice with her. I mean, again, this is, this is the finals for North America, so I would expect every champion to be really showcased to the utmost of their potential, but this is game one, so we wanna, we're want to. we probably going to expect to see a little bit more cautious of play. Nobody really wants to make the first mistake. So we'll see how this all works out. I'm actually going to do a quick change of the light. Hold on. Give me one second here. Ooh, ah. You guys probably don't notice that, but it fixes the glare and <laughs> subtle little thing. Um, so again, we're going to have t uh, Cloud9 going to be spawning on the blue side. TSM going to be spawning on the red side. Let's see what kind of start. Again, since it's the very first game, we would expect to see a more standard five-point defensive start from both sides, and it looks like that's what we're seeing from both sides here. It's hard, It was hard to tell on the red side uh, because we're having the gorgeous opening cinematic that goes through and features the banners and everything. I love that. Um, but yeah, so five, standard five-point start. When I say five-point start, I mean here, 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 here. And here, 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 here. This gives both sides complete vision of the river. And it allows both sides to know if any sort of invade is happening. Typically, it will start to lean um, vision towards like where the jungler is gonna start because you'll start to see the jungler, excuse me, rotate and gravitate towards whichever side of the map they're going to be uh, going after and getting a nice ward in here will help them see where Ivan starts. He is in fact going to start the Raptors. Most junglers right now at the pro level are starting the Raptor camp uh, just because it can get them, if they get a nice leash from their mid laner, Ivern obviously doesn't really need it so Bjergsen's going to come in here to harass and try and interrupt this. But let me pause right here because this is actually going to be a fight breaking out, I can already tell. The idea is someone like a Cassiopeia will get a bit of AoE damage on the little raptors here, which makes the jungler who uses whatever initial AoE ability they have, for Lisa, and that would be his E, makes it a little bit easier to clear out the little ones quickly, and he can focus fire them down with his autos to finish them off. The big raptor doesn't actually deal that much damage and if you clear the entire little raptors without um, 
sharing any experience, you're going to take, uh, you're going to hit yourself level two in time to clear out. Wow, in time to clear the big raptor, and it's going to help a lot with your clear. This is what I'm talking about. This is why I so we needed to hit pause. And I hit resume a little too quickly. This is a beautiful rotation if we look back. As soon as, so they warded here. This is, this is a ward for C9, right? Because it's a blue side ward. The reason you ward here right now is for this exact invade, right? Especially since it's Ivern. Ivern doesn't need leashes with the camps because of his passive. He just starts them and then he can come back to them or just smite them right off the bat for a quick clear. So it's almost uncontestable to deal with Ivern because he's not going to be lowering their HP so you can't really like kill them <laughs> without him uh, just smiting it out for the entire camp. But with Lee Sin and Cassiopeia, they actually have to work through the health bars of the individual minions in each in the camp. It's one by one. So Talia theoretically wants to come in here, get her uh, Q, I believe it is. I'm not sure I don't play Talia, forgive me, but get her uh, rock throwing going on and try and hit as many of the little camps as possible to take some of the last hits and take the experience to deny Lee Sin her hitting that early level too, which is again the whole reason you start this camp instead of one of the two major buffs, right? Another thing that you can do is if it looks like they're zoning pretty well, you can just get some free harass down on the mid laner who's basically going to be focusing on this to give the leash so they can't return fire at you. So you're gonna get a free round of spells without them being to answer you and even a couple auto attacks here and there to try and trade efficiently, proc your thunder lords right off the bat and you're gonna enter into lane with a huge discrepancy in your favor. However, right now, they see Bjergsen is coming for this and they know that since Bjergsen doesn't have to leash for Ivern, that he's likely to do this kind of invade. So they have the ward to get vision. Great, they see him. Lulu immediately, as we can see on the main map, starts rotating up right now. And that's going to mean, as we see on the main map, watch, he's coming right now, even pinging it out. They back up a little bit to try and play defensively, buy themselves some time. Lulu's almost here. Boom, Lulu's here. So right now, Jensen's going to turn right on the Bjergsen right as Lulu pops out of this brush. And now, this enables contracts. He doesn't get quite as good of a leash as he would have otherwise, but he should be able to clear this camp on his own. So contracts both can clear this camp and have his normal start. A little bit more damage than he would find ideal, but he can do it. He's Lee Sin. And Bjergsen takes a 2v1 bunch of harass damage. Or if Bjergsen, if there was a lot of CC, if this was like a Morgana, for example, and she could bind Bjergsen, Contracts could just leave this camp entirely, join the fray, and attack Bjergsen, and this would be first blood. Now, since it's a Lulu, she doesn't have any like root CC. I mean, she could start Polymorph. But that effectively would just sort of slow Bjergsen. It wouldn't really stop him from doing what he wants to do and trying to retreat back out. So they're just going to have contracts take this camp and take the free 2v1 damage. The only thing that's at risk right now is the Lucian has to play safe because he's in a 2v1 because the Lulu came to make this start secured. So he's got to either give up some initial CS for, until Lulu gets back or even surrender himself to zoning to where he can't even leash the experience off of the minions dying in lane. So depending on how that's played by the Lucian, that's going to be almost for free if Lucian can manage to get himself even in experience range. Missing a couple last hits is not that big of a deal. But getting this damage onto Bjergsen is a huge deal. Because remember, Lulu, we see right here, okay, that's not much damage. But Lulu has picks in her passive. All of this damage right here that hasn't hit yet is coming from picks. Every time Lulu autos, that picks is going to rip through more of Bjergsen's health. And Lulu has Thunderlords this game. So she, this is going to be two Thunderlords 
or excuse me, it's still, even though Jensen on Cassiopeia didn't take Thunder Lords because he needs extra movement speed when he's in those all-in engagements as Cassiopeia, there's still going to be a Thunder Lords proc coming out. So this Thunder Lords that we're seeing hit Jensen right now is going to be equalized by the Thunder Lords that Lulu's going to get off onto Bjergsen. And this damage from them both focusing right now is just going to stack harder onto Bjergsen. And that's exactly what we see happen right here. Lulu hits the uh, Glitter Lance. And look at how low Bjergsen's taken. Like, he almost has to recall right now before starting. This is insane. He has to blow through both of those biscuits or recall. And if he recalls, he's way too behind in experience because he's going to miss one or two waves. Cassiopeia is going to shove that out. He's going to, I mean, the minions, I think, are starting to spawn right now. So he's going to miss at least one and a half waves worth of experience. And he will be under leveled versus Cassiopeia for like the first three levels. That's gonna be insane, oh my god. So he has to burn through both of these biscuits and come to the lane, but now he has no sustain because he's burning through both of his biscuits and they're not even gonna heal him to full. So depending on what masteries Jensen's taken, I bet he's taken the masteries where if they're under a certain percentage of HP, you do additional damage. That's gonna mean all the trades are gonna go in favor of Jensen during the laning phase. Just because Bjergsen can't keep himself topped off above that 40 or 50 percent barrier or threshold to not take the additional damage so not only did he take more damage here but he's going to take more damage in lane and he's got to do some sort of cheeky early recall to get like a second Doran's ring and come right back to lane or grab boots and come right back to lane because he's gotta he's gotta get this lane reset this is a horrible start and remember this all started from a proactive play trying to pressure Lee Sin. Surely Lee Sin's going to take a good deal of damage here and have trouble starting this. But this is basically like getting a free gank off at level 1. Like, I would make this trade in my health as a jungler for that much health on a mid laner easily. And remember, it's not just health. Bjergsen had to burn his ghost during all that. So that's a free summoner spell too. An insane start in favor of C9 when TSM took the initiative to create the start and make the pressure themselves. It came out so far ahead in C9's favor. Actually, pardon me, I misspoke earlier. Contracts is going to start with that shield so he gets a little bit better of a clear so he can sustain it because he wasn't going to take part in that. So he needs to just heal up uh, and avoid as much damage as possible. This is a good play by Sven's Karen, knowing that I mean, Ivern's just like to do this anyway, but knowing that Lee Sin started here and he's not going to have a very fast clear because he had a really poor leash, he's going to have to um, come to blue either really low or come to it really late, probably both. So this is just a free blue for Sun Seren to come in and just smite out immediately, maybe throw down a ward here and then back. Now remember, because of this ward that was put down by C9 early, they're seeing all this time, and they're pinging it out too, so you know they know. Because the ward's right up in that corner. They saw Sven Skarin come. So what Lee Sin's going to do to answer is he's going to go to his red buff, or he's going to go straight to the blue buff. And then he's going to have control of this side of the map. And he's just going to full clear this side of the map or look for a gank on bottom. So they have a ward here. TSM does. So they know he's on it. They know he answered with the invade. That allows Ivern to do a little bit more uh, aggressive clearing on this side. But Ivern doesn't have the ability to clear very well on invades. On the first camp he does because he can smite it and just take it almost instantly after that channel. But with the rest of the camps he would have to start his passive timer and wait for the completion because he doesn't have a whole bunch of smites stored up, you know? So it's really hard for Ivern to invade and if you trade like deep clears like this for both sides, typically Ivern will lose that. Even though he'll get the buff secured without it being contestable, the rest of it he has a lot of trouble actually clearing out. So this is going to be again in favor of Cloud9. It's so early in the game, but these are just 
Wow, that is really aggressive. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's definitely something that is going to stack and help them, which is why immediately seeing this on the word, Karma comes and she just all runs Lee Sin, uses the abilities, throws down the Ignite even, and this is because she knows she has Talia rotating, backing her up. She's like basically right here. She's going to be coming through lane or coming through the river. And Caitlyn is already like right here. So if Lee Sin tries to take the path this way, he's going to run into Caitlyn. If he tries to take the path this way, not as quickly, but he will run into Talia. So the only real way for Lee Sin to get out of this, since they have that great ward there to spot the counter invade, is if Lee Sin goes back to the dragon pit and ward hops over. But as we see, Lee Sin, well, it actually looks like he does have a trinket up. And we know he has safeguard level, so he can make a play like that. It's, it's going to be really tricky, but it is possible for him to get out. It depends where he goes from this blast count. And he went too forward to the Caitlyn there. That's just, there's no way to be sure that the Caitlyn's right there. And that was still a really good play. He almost got out of it. It was the net that killed him. So that was super close. And this is what has to be done for TSM. Because again, mid lane is severely behind from that start. Lee Sin was going to get ahead in that jungle if they let him full clear. And the answer for the mid lane being behind was that Lee Sin, the jungler for C9, was going to be behind. So if he is allowed to get that full clear, or at least like a equivalent clear, he's going to be able to full clear his side of the jungle, jungle much more quickly than Ivern is, and he's going to get a bit of a lead. But it's much riskier for him to do so because he had that worst start. So they have to pressure him. This is a really nice play. This is a really nice start. Great collapse from Caitlyn to like delay herself. So Biofrost, the karma support, forces him to go out. And Caitlyn's here to answer. And Talia was coming to pincer from the top side. Lee Sin basically had nowhere to go. But if TSM didn't play that perfectly, that would have been an advantage for C9 right off the bat. Again, that started from the play that Bjergsen made. But it's TSM. They played it perfectly. Oh my god, did you see that play? We're, we're just two minutes into the game. And if we pause like four times, do you see the plays? Oh my god, TSM is so good. And now Wild Turtle has blue. So he's just going to queue, queue, queue that wave over and over again. Harass, harass, harass. Oh, this is nasty. This is a nasty start for TSM. Ivern's coming. So right now, we've got to remember, bot lane's taken care of, basically. <laughs> At least for this point in the game, bot lane's taken care of. So Ivern's going to try and make a play here in top lane. If both of these side lanes can get ahead right now, if they got a kill onto Kennen, which it doesn't look likely right now, but we'll see. Um, there's still a lot of potential. There's flashes and everything. If they can get a kill here, both of these side lanes are ahead statically. Right? So, that frees up Ivern to do whatever clear path he wants and then just pop in mid constantly until Talia gets a kill. And it forces Contracts, the Lee Sin, to either go mid and try and set that lane ahead immediately, which he's going to be slow to because he just died, remember? So he's going to be far less proactive on the map, and he started boots because he had a suboptimal back timing. He's going to have to either get mid ahead immediately, which means Bjergsen anticipating that is just going to play safe for a little while, or he's going to be forced to like go back and try and answer these leads and try and get the other lanes equalized again, which remember wouldn't get them ahead, it would just get them equalized again. So they're now playing from the back foot and they would be, TSM would have complete control of the game if this can happen. So he does get the flash, it's a really good gank, and Kennen, Kennen's pretty mobile, he, he's pretty safe as far as top laners go, but that flash is down. That matters a lot. And Camila has really good 1v1 potential, so... Oh, just barely. 
missed the net there. If that net had connected on the smoothie, he was dead. That was a dead Lulu for sure. The flash here, even though they're starting to turn back, is because I'm not exactly sure what the cooldown on Karma's Q is. But like, Sneaky's already starting to walk this way. The heels already come out and hit Smoothie, and he's still that low. So that barely kept him alive from the Karma auto attacks. And if Karma Q's like this and hits him, he still dies anyway. So Sneaky's already going to body block and smoothie flashes just to be sure. Good play, that's some good 2v2. And again, probably in part thanks to the fact that Wild Tail has been able, whoops, has just been able to queue out constantly in this matchup with that free blue and just throw down traps everywhere. And again, it all started with this, right? Right in there, he comes immediately safeguards and look at that. He was going to survive. This Ignite was not going to finish him off. Kaylin flashed forward. Flashed forward to get the net off. Insane! She flashed forward to throw the net out. So it would for sure connect. And then if the net didn't kill him, she would be able to get the enhanced ranged auto attack off to get the snipe. Oh my goodness, stop playing. Oh my goodness, that's so sack up. Oh. Insanity. And remember, there is a trap behind this. It's directly here. The vision is obscured slightly, but that's something that Caitlyn's doing. We saw her place a trap and didn't see one appear anywhere. So that almost certainly means it's back behind this turret. So. The, the moving, the movement that Lucian can do is sort of restricted. He can't quite just wrap and path this way. He has to go a bit more safer of a path like that or path around through the bo bottom side here. And Ray looks like he's doing a good job of actually out trading Hanser here in the early game. That's really good for him because remember he lost his flash early. So he's going to need to have control of this top line. Can't quite seem like they're going to make the gank happen. It seems like they don't know if it's warded, and they kind of suspect it is. Actually, it is warded, so that's a good call to not have the least in gank there. But Sven Zarin's going to come right as that's happening. So Lee Sin cleared the scuttle crab while he was there. At least he got that to secure or to make the most out of his time before looking mid. But this is really unfortunate that he can't get there, and now he's not going to be here to answer this gank with a counter gank. So here comes Spence Garen. So good, good juke back before coming here. Good juke like that to dodge the vaulting from Hanser here. And Kennen, since he hasn't been hit yet, still has that speed buff. So he's still running very quickly. Now Ivern is going to throw out his ability right here. Probably going to connect with Ray. That will mean that Sven Scanning can come in close. Because if it connects, it pulls them towards. And remember, still doesn't have flash. It's on cooldown. This is a great example of how to pressure lanes after you successfully ganked them before. Just barely misses it. And that was really great pathing by Ray to run behind the minions as quickly as possible. So even if it was pathed perfectly for him, it was going to hit the minion before it would hit him. Unless if it just grazed over the top of the minions, but he was fast enough because he was still running to pass the minion line. So he's actually going to make it out alive. Still going to be some trading back and forth here to try and get a little red buff damage onto him. But he's going to be fine. And that's really lucky again for C9 because they're going to the TSM's or the Lee Sen's time is not wasted, and Sven Skaren's time is because there's nothing left in topside jungle to take there. So the Ivern just had to recall and then start pathing towards bottom. But Lee Sen's already here. 
He's here right as the Lord comes out, too. That's so unfortunate for TSM. Oh, my God, that's so painful to see. Right as they were warding. So they're going to have to heal immediately just because they weren't prepared for that. Uh, but nothing else is going to come out of that. But that is a summoner down, and that equalizes roughly the summoners for the lane. Um, the Ignite's going to be up a little bit quicker than Smoothie's flashes, but basically equalized. And this is dark right now, but seeing how aggressively Biofrost is just charging in past the minion line absolutely gives away that this Ivern is coming in from the top side. Because they don't see him here, and there's no reason you would play this far forward with that little health unless if you had support coming in. So either there's a teleport coming out from Camille or the Ivern is here, more likely. So good retreat from C9. Playing it safe. Try to get a little bit of damage on Svenskarin. Don't really make too much because he has the trigger seed shield. And it works out to be a fairly even trade in health bars. Some nice resetting of the waves here. Okay. So right now Jensen's pushing up mid lane, right? He wasn't letting it freeze, he shoved it. Why is he doing that? Right? He's already got his tier. So he's already stacking. It's not like a key item back point that he needs to get early anymore because he's already got the tier. So why is he doing that? It's going to free him up to come out here towards the bottom side and start continuing. They already have a ward slightly over here on the map and they have the scuttle down. So he can either look to roam bottom and soak up the minion experience as uh, bottom, their bot side is recalling or he can recall himself and all three lanes can recall at the same time. All three lanes can get back out onto the map at the same time. And the reason it's good to do that in synergy with each other is because if one lane stays out, that means everyone else will get their pushes and are free to roam to that one lane. And then you get a party in the bot lane. You get the five man bot kind of thing going on. So really safe to recall. And in fact, he's gonna recall. So perfect. Uh, Biofrost is actually delaying the Lulu recall, so that's a little unfortunate, but she's going to be fine. She's not going to die or anything. Knowing that they've all recalled together allows Fence Garen to invade again, because even if Lee Sen finds him, it's a 1v1 in the jungle, and nobody's here to support him. Kennen, even Kennen being very quick, is going to be slow to actually make it all the way up to where he could then come over here and start doing damage to Sven Skarin. So it's basically a 1v1 that if Sven Skarin really needed to retreat out of, he could fall back to any of his lanes right now that are nearby. And they have a red ward already in the river here, so they have good control um, over a retreat path. And he spots, they spot out where each other are, fine. Ray now sees that he took Crump and that's it. And Ray's going to go back to farming. Hanser's trying to keep this nice and frozen right here. We notice how he's not shoving it back out. He likes this position as the equalizing point because this means that if, if, if he can maintain this freeze right here, the cannon's going to have to play around here which puts him super vulnerable to ganks from Ivern, especially once he has Daisy. So this is a really good freeze right now by Hanser. Unfortunately, the turret is going to aggro, but it's still, there's so many caster minions here, it's still in Hanser's favor for the freeze. And Cannon wants to deny that. He wants to try and push, push this out as quickly as possible, so before this next minion wave that's almost here gets there, the last of these casters will get in range of the turret 
and then the turtle will reset the wave and it won't completely reset because these minions are so close they're like just a little bit over here but it will reset to somewhere like here which is a lot more safe and he does have a pink ward in the river red ward in the river rather so he's going to be able to see ganks that are coming through that more deep path it's ones that are coming right through here out of tri brush that are going to kill him and if he has to play in this sort of position with a freeze right here ganks from tri brush can actually connect with him ivern can land his initial shot onto him and then both can just jump gap close right to him so he's not going to be able to make it happen trying his best best to last hit those But the, the waves stacked on Camille's side because Kennen actually opted to not try and push it into the turret knowing that the minion wave was too close because the minion waves are parallel on both sides so he could tell from his minions that her minions were right here. So instead he let it freeze and Camille used uh, the sweeping ability that hit multiple targets and between those different aspects, now more minions survived on TSM's side. So even though it's going to be frozen right here for like a single wave, the wave is now pushing out. So it's going to be a lot further back here. It's eventually going to be coming back. And that's going to be frozen much more favorably for C9 when it does. Bjergsen's going to recall now. Minion waves are already shoved up, so it's good. It keeps Cassiopeia pinned to that mid lane turret, which means if they want to hand off this blue to her, which they definitely do, you definitely want to give Cassiopeia a blue buff, uh, Contracts is going to have to stand there and tank it for a little bit like he's doing. So this additional damage on Lee Sin is all because of that. It's basically Bjergsen damage because he shoved that lane in quicker. And Lee Sin doesn't want to wait to start blue buff just in case he mistimes it and then wastes time. It's better to just take the damage. And now that Sven Skinner is high enough level, they're sharing the buffs thanks to his passive. And now Hauntzer has red buff. I don't know if you've played against Camille with red buff, but that's, that's pause worthy. <laughs> Oh, and immediately, they're just going to all in him right here. And he's going to go down because there's nowhere to run. He does flash, but Daisy's going to get the knockup to secure it. And they're going to give it over to Hanser. Oh, so unfortunate. And that's just because, again, we talked about it earlier. He had the vision of the red ward in the river brush, but he didn't have the tri brush warded. And on top of that, Camille did have the tri brush warded. So when he was walking through there, possibly to like try and establish vision there, or at least like clear out uh, any red wards for TSM that were sitting in that brush, he had to face check it. And like, he didn't face check into a champion immediately, but he face checked into a warded area where two enemies were nearby. So they were able to just rotate immediately and all in and, and get the kill because Camille's ultimate can keep him from leaving that zone. He has to stay there. Oh, that's so unfortunate. And they're actually, because of seeing that play topside, this is just beautiful play from Cloud9. Seeing that play was made topside, Lee Sin immediately runs past his own red buff, mind you. He runs over to the enemy blue buff, starts it, and even though they could get a blue buff on two characters right now, Lee Sin doesn't need blue buff. He's an energy-based champion. His cooldowns aren't significant. He's not like a Skarner that's a, all about one of his like cooldowns being up. Skarner's even less dependent on that now after his rework, but he's not like old school Warwick. Or like Nocturne today. <laughs> Nocturne is all about that uh, ultimate cooldown. So he doesn't need the CDR because he's not based on just that cooldown. 
nearly as much as a Nocturne would. So what they do is, even though Jensen like has only run through about like half of the blue buff from their side, they're just going to give him the enemy blue buff to refresh it. And one, that denies Bjergsen from getting a blue, and it extends by 50% the time that Jensen's going to have a blue buff advantage over Bjergsen. Svenskaren is coming as quickly as possible to try and stop this, but it's just too late because Cloud9 rotated to that so quickly. Puts the shield onto Daisy, which makes the slow come out onto Jensen when the trigger seed pops, which means that Daisy can get that third auto attack and get this knockup off, and that gives Bjergsen enough time to throw down his ultimate, her ultimate rather, Bjergsen is a male, but the character's not, um, from Talia, and get a wall off, you can see on the mini-map, it's going to wall off this entire section. So this retreat path is gone. They have to fight right now. Looking at the mini-map, we see, I think it's Caitlyn and Karma. It's kind of hard to tell right now. I think Caitlyn and Karma are already just slightly below right here. So they have to fight now. Their retreat path is cut off. If Bjergsen hops right back off and just sort of summons the wall or hops off right here. Cloud9, the mid laner and the jungler, can't run this way because they'd have to run through Svenskaren and Bjergsen. And if they run through this way, they're going to be hitting the wall, so they'll have to run all the way to lane before cutting over. And that means they're going to have to run through the enemy bot lane. So this is not a favorable fight for C9 right now because of that beautiful Weaver's Wall. And we see he does pop off immediately because you can see from contracts, he's already hoping that Je Bjergsen would take the wall too far. And they could just give a little damage on his fence Karen and then retreat up this way through the river. But he hops off right at the start, perfectly played. Even with the flash from Jensen, they're still not in proper position to retreat. And Contracts, notably, still doesn't have his ultimate because he's been punished so far in the plays we've been seeing. So that under-leveling is coming into huge effect here. Just imagine, if Lee Sin had his ultimate right now, Bjergsen is knocked all the way back here. That means the only thing that's holding Jensen here is Svenskaren. Pretty sure his uh, root is already on cooldown. So Lee Sin can give Jensen the safeguard. As you see, the ghost has popped. So Jensen's going to be very quick in running out of here. And they have the TP coming in to give additional security if they got caught. But the TP could likely be cancelled if Lee Sin has his ultimate. Since he's not, he doesn't have his ultimate, Bjergsen is able to flash to reposition, get a little extra damage down onto this Cassiopeia, and then the ultimate coming out from Caitlyn going to finish him off. I have to cancel that TP. It was matched from Hanser, so the top side teleports are equalized. That's just beautiful play. Again, Cloud9 makes the right rotational play to try and get for when they lose something, like when um, earlier, at the very start of the game, Ivern came and took their blue it's the correct rotational play to answer and take their blue. But TSM is just doing, they're thinking one step ahead of them every time. And they were ready to collapse quicker and pincer the Lee Sin last time. And what happened this time? Sure, again, they secured the blue buff for their side and they refreshed it on Jensen. But the same exact pincer, I almost don't have to redraw these arrows, the same exact pincer happened. And right at the dragon, they, they lost another fight. And that means now that it's actually got some levels onto both sides, since they lose a fight at dragon and everybody's already here, that means that's a free dragon. And this, mind you, is an infernal drake. This dragon matters a lot. That is some percent damage for both magic and physical. This is going to do a lot for their team. Haunter is going to become a nightmare. Wild Turtle, who now has two kills, going to become a nightmare. Oh, this is just... 
<laughs> I love that Infernal Drake graphic, that's great. But again, look, this is the, was the correct play. And just barely the trigger seed range gets the slow, which means the third auto comes in. And even though Contract smites down Daisy, that's so much damage on a Jensen. And again, there's just no way to run because that Talia wall is up. And it's just, they're done. And that's not just another kill in the bot lane, which again, gets another blue on a wild turtle. Insane control of this lane goes to TSM. He's going to be able to queue this wave whenever he wants to shove. He's going to be able to queue around the wave whenever he wants to try and harass. This is just a completely controlled lane for TSM now. But it also gets a death timer on a Jensen that buys Bjergsen some time alone in the mid lane to get a, the CS equalized. And now mid lane isn't behind at all. And remember, since Cassiopeia has to go tier in her initial items, she's playing from a disadvantage again. She's back on the back foot. There is no advantage in uh, minions anymore to compensate for that. And of course, haunts her. And let's like look at this again: thirty-four hundred to just shy of thirty-four hundred. There's like a forty gold difference. It's like two minions, completely equalized again. All because Jensen died there because of that play, and he wasn't in lane because he was coming from base. Gives them a little breathing room to come in. Clear out some vision, establish some of their own. Really good vision points here toward here, here, and here. This further strangle holds the bot lane, right? Because if Lee Sin comes bot side, yeah, this is <laughs> this pull. Yeah, this is looking like a TSM win game for sure. If Lee Sin tries to come into the bot side to make this bot lane at all have a chance of coming back against Wild Turtle, he's going to have to come through the jungle. Unless he walks through lane and denies himself clearing all these camps in the meantime on his way, that's going to cut himself out a lot of experience, which remember, he was so underleveled before he didn't have his ultimate for that last fight, which could have completely changed the dynamic of that last fight. But he didn't have it because he's behind. So he needs to be very efficient with his pathing. So he has to walk through the jungle and take these camps on his way to hit bot lane, or he's going to put himself way far behind by avoiding that vision. So getting all three of these wards, and the one just north of here, means any time Lee Sin is in the vicinity, they're going to know it, and they're going to be able to start playing safer. They're going to be able to retreat with plenty of time. And Ivern's even going to further deny Lee Sin another camp. Oh, so brutal. Since they pinged that out, because they did see it coming, oh, Lee Sin was going to come and try and counter jungle, but Sven Skarin came in quickly enough to snag, uh, snag it out from under him. That's one of the powers of Ivern, right? If you get there at the same time and you already prepped it, you just secure it, not a problem. It's a good trade on to Ray. Now it's a good point being made in the background by the casters. Cassiopeia is like a hyper carry late game. So if they can make it late, this certainly isn't a game that's over. Even though it looks very heavily in favor of uh, TSM right now, it certainly isn't over yet. And a Cassiopeia late game can really carry hard. So... Definitely not over. Just a severe disadvantage in the early game. Because I mean again, look at that look at that team gold score. Nearly two K lead right now. Eleven minutes in. Insane. A little bit of struggling over vision here. Good control. This stops the gank from coming in top. 
to this uh, scuttle shrine would have still seen him. And Ray was already pushed in regardless, so Ray's pretty safe top. Okay. So why just brute force this, brute force this as Ivern? Is because Daisy can tank up the turret, right? And if Daisy doesn't do anything else but tank up the turret, that's so much free time. Like, look how they all they did was engage using their basic abilities so far from the bot lane and throw down ignite. And Lulu's already that low. If Daisy can tank up the turret at all, if they can properly drop the aggro here. That's a dead Lulu, without the turret even swapping over yet. They drop the aggro. It goes on to Biofrost, actually. So they do need to back off, and that's actually what's going to save them here. Smoothie and Smoothie's ultimate. If Smoothie didn't have his ultimate up, he was dead regardless. But since he had his ultimate up, the mismanagement of the aggro there... Now Daisy's tanking, but now it's too late. They gotta back off because Lee Sin's here at this point. So that was really close still. <laughs> Smoothie almost died to that anyway. It's just because they couldn't quite properly manage the aggro on that to drop it onto Daisy. And since they couldn't drop it onto Daisy, they had to back off. They're still too squishy. It's still far too early into the game. And while that worked out for Cloud9, you gotta remember that's a proactive play being made by TSM. Oh man, this is brutal. This is so brutal. They have no vision. They don't know he's here. This is gonna be really tough. And he has smite, so he's just gonna smite it out. Oh, unfortunate. That's too bad. Okay, so finish the previous point. Remember, that was a proactive play being made by TSM, so even though it didn't result in a kill, didn't result in much advantage, TSM is still maintaining control of the map, and Lee Sin had to come and answer that. So they're forcing Lee Sin to get suboptimal pathing, because he has to answer these attacks that are being made. So now, he's a little bit slower to get to this blue buff than Ivern is, so Ivern's going to be able to get this passive off, and then smite it out before Lee Sin can get in. And then... The this once again forces Lee Sin to have to try and answer by taking their blue buff. And every time this game he's done that, he's been punished. Every single time. So what we're looking at here is not if Kennen can come down and make some sort of miracle kill onto Ivern. There's no way they're going to react in time for that. And it would just be matched by the respective laners, right? And Ivern has Flash. It's, it's just, he has Daisy. It's not going to happen. But what is going to be decided here is how this blue buff is handled. If C9 just surrenders it entirely, then TSM gets a 3 buff this late into the game, which really matters. Svenskaren, as Ivern, loves to have his blue, and Bjergsen will get their side's blue. Great. Yeah. Or excuse me, Daisy was just still remaining from the last team fight, of course. And this blue buff is just sitting here, right? That means if Hanser can push in top like he has been doing, now he has a reason to walk down to right here within this zone, and he'll get whoops this zone. I'm not sure how good yellow shows up for you guys. Um, and he'll pick up that blue buff. And again, he'll be a Camille that has another buff in lane. Which is just insane to have to deal with. Bjergsen's unlikely to be able to take it. He's trying to push in to give himself a little bit of freedom. But it's going to have to be focused on helping Biofrost make it out of here safely. Luckily, he does... He is able to push it out, so Biofrost is going to be fine getting out here. But he's unlikely to make it over to this blue buff anytime soon. So what he's relying on is Svenskaren on Ivern to come over here to this blue buff, take it, 
And then he'll be able to pick up their blue buff safely. Great continued chase here to force that flash. Because Cassiopeia still had her ultimate. If she was walking, Karma was still walking up here. Cass could just point blank ulter and she'd be dead. Because she'd be locked down for so long. The suppression from Cassio's Pia's ult, if you're looking right at her when she, like, does that gaze at you, <laughs> you're going to be locked down for quite a while. So, instead of just seeing, like, okay, he's going to make it out, he's fine. Especially because Sven's carrying is a little bit further out. And Bjergsen didn't rotate quite aggressively down because he didn't want to, like, force a fight here. Chasing this and following this is absolutely the right call, and it forces that flash. As soon as Bjergsen didn't come down with him and put himself in that danger zone, that's exactly what you got to do. And that's a free flash. Free flash on the support. Not the biggest thing, but the bot lane is a huge problem for Cloud9 right now. I mean, look at that CS advantage. 109 to 142. 30 plus minion dis discrepancy. Now it's like, that's more than these kills. Or it's right about as much as those kills are worth. I think one of them was first blood, so probably not. But somewhere within that range. So getting a free summoner spell is very important. And there's still no turrets down yet. So first brick is still available. Which is why, like, getting a good gank off in one of these side lanes gives them time to auto-attack the turret down. And that's actually going to make a big impact for the whole team because there's going to be the additional first brick gold coming out. And they're playing really aggressively here. Trying to get as much damage in because they knew the gank was coming, so they're trying to prep it as much as possible. And both junglers have the same idea of like these side lanes really matter. So let me go to bottom, try and get control of that lane temporarily, and hopefully our AEC will still be alive, who just does a bunch of physical damage from auto attack, so we can then immediately just push the enemy tower, depending on who wins the fight. And we can go ahead and take that first brick for our side. Which for C9 would help equalize out this gold discrepancy. So they still have no contract is here. They throw down the brush in here to try and get vision, but it still doesn't have vision of contracts, who's right there. So they don't know where contracts is right now. They have a suspicion he's probably matching them, which he is. And now they're going to know he's here. They're going to clear out that pink ward and get a ward of their own. Great. But again, here's the focus on the side lanes, right? Okay, we couldn't make a play happen bottom. And in fact, we're pulling Karma with us all the way up to here with Ivern to help secure ward control around this dragon that's now up. It's just ocean, so we don't have to force it. But we want to prep out ward control, and if we get enough ward control to get it for free, we'll take it. But we don't have to force it. So Bjergsen, if you see an opportunity to use that ultimate top side to maybe zone off this cannon and keep him stuck in zone, uh, in, in a range for Camille to get her ultimate off, which will further trap him in a zone, use it. And that will be the lane we push to try and get the first brick. So that's exactly what Bjergsen does. He doesn't quite get the wall deep enough to block anything, but just summoning it makes him get here so quickly that Ray has to flash. Camille answers it because they both had flash available. There wasn't much pressure top before this. Well, recently there wasn't much pressure top. So they both have flash available. Camille is able to just answer and then get her ult down, even though now Kennen can ult and get the stun. Trapping him in this zone means that Kennen just can't keep retreating this way, right? So even if Camille is stunned temporarily, and that means Kennen's not gonna take damage immediately, Bjergsen's still going to be able to get damage off on him if he's running. And if he comes towards Bjergsen to get the stun off on Bjergsen as well, Bjergsen can try and kite this way a little bit and keep Kennen 
from Kai or zoning far enough close into him to get the AOE from his ultimate off on Bjergsen as well. Or if uh, even if he does get it off, it'll pull Ray this way instead of towards his turret. So Ray's in a basically no win situation here now that that ultimate's come off, gone off. It was a good flash, but Camille was just zero hesitation in answering it. And that's just the power of the 2v1. And again, because there was so much support here, from the support and the jungler for TSM already being right around here in the river, that means Bjergsen is free to just go top, even if a push, like, since the lane was already pushing out this way as well, even if it wasn't, they could rotate up and they could soak the XP and minions, so nothing would be lost mid lane while that was happening. Only now are the minions crashing into the turret and Bjergsen's already back there. Now because of that, they see an opportunity to go in on the Drake, but remember what we said earlier? It's Ocean Drake, not the most important Drake of the game. Getting that kill and securing that lead for top lane, where they lose their only combat summoners on both sides, means that Camille is going to dominate this top lane now. This, this lead in CS, or basically equal CS for both sides that you see, that's over. That's over. Camille is going to destroy Kennen in lane now. And we're going to start to see the discrepancy like we see in bot lane, where there's 30 plus CS going to TSM. And this goes all the way back to what we talked about towards the beginning. If they can get those side lanes secured, that means they can just focus mid lane. Focus, focus, focus mid lane. And then there's nothing that can be done. And mid lane already has a bit of advantage just because he's got two assists to none. But that's going to be even worse. So they do get the dragon, but it's one ocean drake for C9 for one fire drake for TSM. That's fine. Make that trade any day of the week. This is some great harass coming in. They actually do get the knockup, which prompts them to look for an all-in. Not going to find it. Daisy does die to her, but that's fine. With how much harass they got in, great. And that's exactly... Okay, so two things from that. Already we see the focus mid, mid, mid. Ivern couldn't make, couldn't make this anything come of coming to this dragon. So he just continues swooping over and then gets so much damage onto Jensen as he's coming back to mid lane from that dragon pit that now mid lane's already taken care of. This discrepancy is huge. That means until the next back, Jensen's going to be playing way on the back foot and he only has a refillable pot, right? They don't necessarily... They didn't necessarily check to see how many charges he has, and I can't actually see because of the line from YouTube. <laughs> but nonetheless, because the focus was Dragon, I gave Camille free time top lane on here. They secure the first turret. Let me clear that. The first turret, there we go, which is extra gold for the whole team. There you go. Further extending that gold lead. It gets... Again, even greater control of this top side because now, as you notice, he waited, Camille did, until all of the red side minions for TSM were killed by the turret. So these and like the minions from this wave have barely taken any damage. So this wave is going to equalize probably right around here, somewhere in that zone. And since there's now no longer a turret here, Cannon is not safe until he's like back in this area and he's going to have to be playing up here. This cannon is super vulnerable right now and he doesn't have flash from that last engagement. This is a bad time for Ray. Ray is going to have a bad, bad time. And we already see he's trying to establish a control ward there to extend that range of safety a little bit for himself to more around here. Yeah. Let's look at that again. He goes in, forces the flash by throwing out the tactical sweep, 
flashes to match it, and it's close enough, you know? I think it's easy in retrospect to say, like, he just shouldn't have been in that position. But, like, I mean, when you're against Talia, she's in her lane! She just had finished clearing out her minions. Like, to play so defensively, like, to surrender your minions, as soon as Talia finishes her wave, every time she finishes a wave, you're going to fall so far behind the lane. You just got to hope that between your dash, or not your dash, but your empowered, like, run, and your flash that you could get out of that. And you just couldn't. And you just couldn't. It's just perfect play by TSM. That, I mean, that, as far as that play was concerned, that was just executed wonderfully. So brutal. And now that we see, now that we see the items, they're absolutely right. The casters. I'm, I'm leaning on the casters a little bit, but they're right. Like this cutlass isn't finished into Bork. This isn't built into its item yet. The boots are not leveled yet. Camille has leveled boots that are really effective against Cannon because he is going on hit Cannon, and she has Triforce, which is. The notorious power spike item of League of Legends. <laughs> so that lane is just over now. Anytime Kennen's in that top lane, he's going to be trading poorly with Camille. And this this minion score, the creep score, is going to start way falling in favor of Camille because she's just going to zone him really hard. And the only thing they can do about that to try and answer is try and force TP plays elsewhere on the map and just out-rotate TSM using their teleport. You get better value out of the teleports than TSM does, which is possible. But that means look for C9 to try and be aggressive in starting fights. But where are you going to pick a fight? It has to be mid, which now that uh, Jensen has backed and is arriving in lane, Bjergsen's backing. So they're not going to be able to pick a fight with mid. So what are they going to do? Pick a fight with bot lane? The bot lane that's severely behind two kills to none? And one of those being a first blood? Like, the two major components of Infinity Edge are bot versus a single longsword. Counting these two initial items as equal. That's insane. But you're going to lose that every time. And if you team fight against a Rudon's, in a lane where there's not that many tanky people with a Bork, you're not going to win that fight. You're going to lose that fight. Even taking this level of discrepancy away, which it exists and it matters a lot. Sounds Karen. Looking mid. Does force the ghost out of Jensen there? Because Camille was coming in from above. It wasn't just Jensen. He was winning the... Er, er, Jensen was winning the trade with Svens Karen. It's because the Camille came in. Right? The camera unfortunately panned away, but you see it on the mini-map. The Camille is what forced the ghost there. But this is a very critical moment. And this is, again, what happens. If this, if this lane does freeze here for Kennen, he has to keep it frozen there. He can't shove... Because he will lose this fight 1v1, and if he shoves, Camille will just come back top and start 1v1-ing him when the wave is, like, here. And then he'll die. He'll get ganked and die. He'll get 1v1-ed and die. He can't do it. So he has to freeze it here, which means he has to stay there, which means Camille can roll mid and make a play like this. It looks like, what the hell is Sven scaring doing? He took a whole bunch of damage and had to ult for nothing. But then all of a sudden, Camille comes in over the wall, and now you realize, oh god, I got a ghost. And I'm in a lot of trouble. And she actually gets the ult down onto Jensen, too, so now Jensen's just dead. And look at that, and this is exactly what's happening, right? The rotation. They're all here because they got that play. 
because Cannon is pin pin top lane because he can't leave. To because he, he doesn't want he wants to continue trying to catch up in the minions to count to mitigate how much he's behind in the items. So that allows all right. Bjergsen's just gonna ult in, even if we don't need him for that kill. Because now look, we're all here. Their jungler was here to try and answer this push on this turret and defend it. But now their mid laner's down. Their, telepa their, their teleport top laner has become a non-factor because it's already equalized by Hanser being here without having to use his teleport. Hanser leading the charge. And, even if he doesn't use the teleport, we still have the number of advantage because we just killed Jensen. Daisy's already out, which is fine. She doesn't have, like, a summoning impact. And it will take time for the channel to go off, and he'll lose the advantage of getting to be in this top lane in the meantime, which theoretically would be to answer with a push here, try and take this outer turret, equalize the top lane control. But that means this fight is going to go horrible if he does that. But what is he going to do? It's 5v3 right now. This is just no hope. Absolutely no hope. So I say that, and what happens? They decide to go for the teleport play, right? The caster curse, as it is. As soon as this happens, Ray teleports immediately. That's the only way you can't hesitate. If you know the second you see them coming at this angle, you have to immediately teleport right in the way because you're going to come in at full health so you've got to be right in the thick of it so all of the priority changes to you or you, they have to go through you to get to your allies who are going to already have retreated towards this turret here so he has to make that play immediately he does, great wouldn't expect anything less out of C9 Sneaky flashes and heals Right? That's how these health bars are still what they are. <laughs> it's because they heal, Lulu already ults, and Sneaky flashes. Lulu has already flashed in this engagement as well. So even though it looks okay right now, all those summoners are down. Right? Jensen's gone. All these summoners are down. Now the only summoner coming out from bot lane is Inking Knight. Contracts still has flash kick. That's really good. He can make an insect play and like ult Sven scaring into the turret. Sven scaring not really the ideal target because he's getting a little tanky. But he could do that. If he could uh, get Hanser. Where's Hanser here? Why can't. What? My brain. Why does it say TSM Hanser? There it is. Tonser is the Camille. Okay, er, Sven's carrying is right here. Okay, if he can, <laughs> sorry guys, I'm losing. There's too much happening in the scene fight. I'm losing track of everybody. If he can ult Sven's Karen back in there, Ivern is not super tanky yet. He has some tankish items, but they're like kind of support items because that would that's what Ivern builds, and his boots aren't giving him anything right now. So, you know, that might be a good play get a kill, they could try and turn on Defense Karen and get a kill here. And as soon as Ray comes in, notice the positioning, right? This is where the teleport's gonna happen. That means if Ray ults immediately, this entire zone, basically, maybe a little bit less generous with that, but basically this entire zone is gonna be inside Kennen ult and is gonna be stunned up. Now it's not gonna be the cannon of old where it just melts everyone who's in it because he went AP. Since he went on hit, it's not gonna be nearly as much damage, but it is going to be a stun, which is gonna allow the remaining alive C9 members to reposition properly over here to get themselves in some defensive positions so their bot lane can survive this engagement and they can get some nice damage pushing them back. If they execute it perfectly though, if if there's like a really aggressive flash that comes out, Wild Turtle's probably already too far back because he had to just finish channeling his ultimate. But if there are really aggressive flashes coming out from Biofrost and Bjergsen, especially if Biofrost ignites, 
their bot lane might already die. But they have to play super aggressively right off the bat. The Ignite does come out. That does finish off Lulu. But they are trading a lot of damage on Defense Karen right now. Who walks forward to tank up for Bjergsen. Bjergsen being the squishier of the two. Probably the right thing to do in most cases. But that means Spence Karen is super low right as this teleport channel completes. And four of them are in the cannon ultimate, which, oh my god, so sick. This is like what cannons dream of. <laughs> this is what cannon dreams in the top lane are made of. But not only does it get an ultimate off onto four people, which is going to stun them up primarily, not a lot of damage coming out, but Svens Karen, who is already tanking up that calling from Sneaky, the Lucian ultimate, Sneaky is now going to be able to safely, because they're all stunned, dash back in to get a couple last autos off onto Svens Karen, kill him, and walk away before the stun duration ends. So Sneaky can actually finish off Sven Scarin and turn this a free kill on their support. Because Jensen was already dead during this, right? So this is a 4v5. They have one free kill right now, but they can equalize that. And if they make a 4v5 come out in a 1v1 one one trade when they're already this far behind, slash right through the score there, this far behind and that far in actual gold amount, that's a great trade. They absolutely will take a trade like that. Between the rest of the calling channel and Ray throwing out some auto attacks, exactly what happens. Sven Scarin dies. Ray's standing in range as far as possible, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. After that kill, they need to immediately back off. At least with Lucian, they need to immediately back right back off. Because Lucian is way too low. He almost uh, instantly dies from Bjergsen throwing down those rocks and getting the damage coming out. He's probably going to die now still. But if he had died instantly there, that means Ray is way out of position, already fairly low himself, and might die too. So all of a sudden it was a great one-for-one -one trade after the unfortunate kill happened. Being able to pull off a one-for-one one is great. Thinking you're going to get anything else out of this, it's Hauntzer. Remember, Hauntzer's deceptively tanky right now. So even though he's very low, that's a lot of little lines in that small bar. It's not like it's a Wild Turtle bar. If Wild Turtle's bar was that low, okay, maybe I would chase for that too. This is not the person to chase on. And especially not when you're not anywhere near healthy enough to chase. So immediately Lucian dies in a return kill. Contracts only now realizes, Oh my god, what have we done? And so he flashes. <laughs> he flashes out. Again, just what I was saying, Ray, Ray's cannon is so low that turning the focus on him from Wild Turtle is going to kill him. He goes down. Only Contracts makes it out. What could have been a one for one and no less a support for a jungler typically a very good trade to make just position wise became remember jensen was already dead before the start of this became a three for one not a good trade anymore absolutely not especially because now uh, all of the remaining members from tsm are already down here in position to just focus down this turret and then they'll knock out a bottom turret, a bottom inner turret, when the next drake that's coming up is an infernal. With already one infernal in their pocket, they want to have control of this area of the map. And if they knock down the turret right here, that's going to extend a lot more control of this jungle area. This whole area should now be TSMs if they can take down this turret. Which means that next Infernal should be theirs for free. They'll get two Infernals stacked up. And when those kind of dragons start stacking, it, it goes multiplicatively effectively. <laughs> it, it stacks additively, but it feels multiplicatively. <laughs> Is having a strong game, but it's led by Hauntzer here. He's the one who and 
Having these control roads already down for all that is really good vision control. Unfortunately, they still couldn't make the play work out for them. But because of that, it does delay some of the backs because they want to be sure to back out of vision as safely as possible to not risk anything on their way back because TSM should have such good control over this already. Now all they got to do is play by the numbers, walk it down, sweep out those wards, reestablish control over the pit, and that's a free dragon for them. Yeah, and looking at this play again, there's just nothing... Nothing that could be done. Unless if they have bailed out immediately after getting that return kill, it, there's just no other hope there. Good sidestep by Jensen there. Yeah, and again, that's a mid lane. So remember, the sweep we just made was something like this. Is now TSM's control because the inner turret went down. Well now, since the outer mid turret went down, we can actually extend that control to something like this. And that just further creates a stranglehold around this dragon pit, which is about to spawn the second infernal drake for TSM, which is a really important dragon for them. So that's why they're focusing there. Even though the Baron's up and they've got a really large lead, so maybe they could try and force a Baron. Why risk it? Why not just play safe? And look at this. This is what we're talking about. This card is not going to make it in time. And this wall turtle is going to kill him. Look at that. Like, you just can't. He's too far behind. The Kaelin was 3 0 and 1 with two items completed and boots upgraded to one item completed and boots, and then, like, a health item and a longsword. Because he's not able to get these items out as optimally as Caitlyn is just because he has less gold. He's behind in CS, he's behind in kills, he can't 1v1 Wild Turtle like that. I don't care how good it looks that he's isolated because Biofrost is out. I don't care how strong they feel like, oh, well, we still have vision control here because they haven't swept out these pink, uh, red wards, control wards yet. But look at this, his team is still all the way down here, right? They're not here yet. Even though the enemy team is in this side of the jungle now, so he feels like something can be made, if he goes in aggressively over wall, now if Caitlyn walked down here and the fight broke out right there, okay, maybe. But if he goes over a wall and creates tons of distance between him and his allies, they're not going to be able to close that gap. Hell, Karma is able to ro close that gap rotating from mid quicker than they are. Which is why we see in the fight that breaks out, Karm is the only one that's in frame. And look at that. This is exactly what happens. He starts by dashing over a wall. Because he's like, oh, I use my ward. I've got vision. I see you. I know you're lower than me. Yeah, but he's a level ahead of you. And he's two kills ahead of you. And an assist ahead of you. And had a way better item break last time you backed than you did. You're going to lose that trade. You're going to lose that trade every time. Even with that ward. And like, this isn't to say Sneaky played that wrong. That was a perfect play. He warded that without missing a single auto attack. Wild Turtle almost died there. But like, this is just them being too far behind. You can't make those plays. And if you can't make those plays, how are you going to come back? Because stuff like this is going to happen in top. Cannon, again, like we talked about earlier, he's a non-factor in this game. Unless he can make those TP plays like they tried, but they didn't retreat quickly enough. So now this game is just spiraling out of control. Look at that scoreline. Look at that gold differential. Look at the towers. Five to zero. This is insane. The, the stranglehold has begun. The only inner turret that's surviving for C9 right now is mid. And here, here's some minions already pushed into it, you know? Like, they have complete control over this map. And Great Burke active pop too. He even gets the second double shot off. He just couldn't kill him. He just couldn't kill him. It's just not happening, man. 
Caitlyn's that champion that you talk about having the weak mid game. The Blade of the Bloom King, Black Timber Power Spike is where CP is supposed to have the edge on Lucian. Good scrolling word there by Bjergsen to make sure, hey, am I about to get ganked? Exactly what was happening. <laughs> Again, there's no reason right now to not just play it safe. You know, why go forward to try and get those minions as Bjergsen? Here, let me actually just go back. Because this is, this is a kill we're about to analyze here. Why go any far forward to the minions that were froze right here? Why go forward in lane when there could be anyone right there? And put myself in a 2v1? Even if it was just a support Lulu? Who's like not like super fed and going damage or anything? <laughs> even so, why risk it? Why not just scry that brush just to be safe? And even if nobody's there... It then leaves the permanent scrying ward there to start establishing control of the vision around the dragon. Because even though they have like free reign of the map right now, does TSM? They don't quite have complete vision control over it yet because it's now, it's new control from killing turrets recently. Here comes Hanser. Great click on the side of the wall there to get the vault over. Good dodge by Ray to back off as far as he can. Good ultimate. He got Hanser got the shield up before the ult came out, so he soaked up some of the damage from the ultimate. And you can see, even though like Hanser's bar percentage-wise is less, you can see just from the number of ticks, Hanser is so much more tanky than Ray is, because now he's got the Titanic Hydra completed too. Again, he's just He's got a whole item completed compared to one component and boots completed in a relevant way because they block all on-hit auto attack damage from Kennen compared to boots that are just boots one. That's really unfortunate. He might actually die here now. The, the redemption coming in from Svenskaren is amazing map awareness right here to know to throw down this redemption to make sure he's going to survive. And only because of this redemption is it possible that Camille lives right here. Camille actually could die just because she missed that vault. After the ult, this vault is very risky because the vault takes you pretty far. And if she doesn't hit Ray, who right now you can tell is going to be moving very quickly because he's got that ability turned on so he can juke either way very effectively so he's got to be super confident with landing this and because it actually is pretty close <laughs> right just because of those health bars he has to land this for the cc so this is missing this right here and not only missing it but missing it at that angle so it broke this, so Ray is no longer boxed in at this wall. Ray can just leave now if he thinks it's not going to be a favorable trade. And if he thinks it's a favorable trade, that's bad. Because one of his major abilities is down now. Like I said, the redemption coming in is the only thing that keeps this from going horribly for Hanser here. And Ray flashes back in! Oh my god, I can't believe that flash! Did you see the flash? Hold on! I don't know, I think he's still gonna die. <laughs> he's right because of the shield. But look at that. He backs off, right? So he takes the redemption damage, which actually makes the difference here. I bet if he didn't take this redemption damage, because Kevin's ranged, he could be hitting him from right here. If he had backed away quicker, and sure, Hauntzer still gets the redemption heal. But if he just didn't take that redemption damage, he would be a lot healthier right now. He would have a good like third of his current health added to himself right now. He backs all the way off here, so Hanser feels safe walking back here. Remember, Hanser's flash is down. And he starts coming back, which would mean Hanser would start to retreat after he gets these minions. But then he flashes, so now Hanser's like, Oh damn, I needed to retreat right now. But he gets the stun immediately. 
He's getting that on hit damage, which the Bork does matter and does chunk out Hansard very quickly. Only that shield. And remember, look at how low that health bar is. Look at how low his health bar is. If he had, again, dodge that redemption, that's more than twice his HP right now, is what he would be at if he had dodged the redemption damage. And look at how low beyond the shield, look at how low Hanser is. If the redemption didn't come out from Sven's Karen, Hanser 100% dies to Ray here. 100%. In a matchup where he's crushing Ray. And he almost dies anyway. It's only from that shield that he got. So close. Incredible. There's no reason it should ever be anywhere near that close. Sure, because of all that action going on on the back foot, they take this dragon for free. Second Inferno matters a lot. But man, that would have been a shutdown going over to Ray, which is additional gold, which he desperately needs. It should never be that close. It should never be that close. Sven Skarin had to rotate for the dragon to bring a smite there to secure it. But man, if he did not get that redemption out, that redemption was the money play. This redemption, man. His auto attack sidesteps yet again, has to live through the redemption, and here he can quit. He's kind of withstood Hauncer early, but he flashes in because he knows he has the marks for the stun, but he doesn't have enough damage. Hauncer gets his shield back, and then lands. So close. That's so close. Oh my god, that's so close. What is that, like 50 hit points? Oh man, that's so close. Uh oh, did our stream freeze? Can you guys see me all right? I think it's probably just my computer. But man, that's so close! Oh my god! If the redemption, I'm telling you guys, the money redemption, that is why people buy that item. It's for moments like this. Incredible. Incredible. Okay, the camera's fine. Well, it's just my computer. That's that unbelievable, unbelievable play. Yeah, man, if you would auto drain lightning rush, that would have made the difference there. That's too bad. Good dodge by Sneaky. Good presence of mind to just calmly walk up and dash over the wall. <laughs> Contracts hiding in the ivory bush. And look at this. All the words now that they. Now that they took that dragon, and it's going to be a long time until the next Infernal comes up, just get utter control over this barren area. This clears the entire pit. Now they change the like vision zone for these. And this clears about like this whole area, right? Which means the only way that they could enter unseen, especially because of all these wards right here littering the map, is through this path. But there's already a Karma and a Tilia there. So this is free right now. They get to come in and start it. Ivern can bring in Daisy to help tank. And even though they have this, the uh, Scuttle, if they try to come, they're going to be seen. And they can just peel away basically full health while a Turtle taking some damage. They're basically full health. Because they didn't take uh, any damage from Daisy tanking it all up. And now that it's co becoming close, beautiful Weaver's Wall from Tilia. She ults, creates the wall there, further zoning them away. And that gives them, even if they tried to all in to contest it, that gives them enough time to come up here, get a last little bit of focus fire to burst it down. 
and that Baron's down before C9 could even be in range to contest it. An answer in the bot lane, looking for the split push. He actually does hit him there, and now he locks him in. Look at that. This is what that matchup should look like, right? This is how that should have looked like. Even this is like, he lost half his health here. It might not even be that much. It might. It should go even more one-sided. But this is how one-sided that should be. If you start off with the vault in, especially if you connect it like you did this time, and then you throw down the ultimate, then Kennen has nothing he can do. Sure, right now he runs really fast, but he's up against a wall. It doesn't matter how fast he runs if he has nowhere to go. Easy. Easiest kill of his life. Yeah, this is like incredible. They only have one kill. One kill. Oh, it's so unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. I mean, they have Baron right now. Talia picks up the blue buff from Ivern. They've got the push coming in top lane. Remember, after that, the bot lane is already pushing on its own right now. So with with Camille splitting at the outer turret here, or the inner turret, that frees up pressure from being able to answer the inhibitor turret, which is the far more important goal, right? If you break the inhibitor turret, you, you open up the base, right? So you don't even need Baron anymore to get that inhibitor down. They have to make a play like this, C9 does, which leaves Camille alone in the mid lane to take down that last inner turret for free. Which means, as long as they can prevent contracts from doing any fancy insect ult, which he's trying really hard right now, if they can prevent that, which they do, they turn it into a free kill for themselves. Great, that's over. They lost not only this inhibitor turret in the end, but they lost the inner turret in, uh, in the mid lane as well, because Camille still giving that Baron buff over to the minions. Well, actually, the Baron looks like it just timed out. Oh no, we're looking at Lucian. Never mind. Yeah, that Baron. I was going to say that Baron should not have timed out. That seems a little strange. <laughs> But yeah, so they're going to actually take down that inhibitor turret and try and take the second inhibitor using Daisy to tank. Not quite got it just yet, but with all those Baron empowered minions, you can't survive. And look at that. Remember, this is from before. I said the bot lane was already pushing in. Look at that. They just keep the same position. Four people to the north, one Camille to the center. Okay, we've got the only objective here while Camille was getting the inner turret. Rotate. Four people to the inhibitor. One Camille to the bot lane. You know? Just keep that same positional rotation. And at the very end, now Camille has brought this... Well, only three minions. But there's a whole other wave coming right behind him. And now all five of them are grouped up again. Beautiful Weaver's Wall by Bjergsen. Look at that. Knocks Ray out. Nobody can break, get over this wall as Lulu or Ray. It almost could have knocked Ray this way, which would have just been all five of them immediately turning onto Ray to get a kill. So it almost was a free kill on top of this, but it isolates this turret. This turret can't be defended. They can just walk right up to it. They don't need a whole bunch of minions. And now the final inhibitor is exposed. Yeah, and they all decide to back. Because look, like, they've got the two super minions coming through top lane and mid lane right now. There's no reason to try and over greed for that last uh, inhibitor turret because there's no objectives on the top side of the map because Baron's down. 
the Infernal Drake is coming up. So why not let them have to answer these two lanes of pressure? While well, this lane was already pressured as well. So if they get some of these lanes of pressure reset to these positions, we can answer mid, we can answer bot, and that'll put us in position to go get the last Infernal Drake. We'll get triple Infernal, and then we can all regroup from the Dragon Pit and go right in, get the last inhibitor, and close out the game. Very clean play by the numbers. They rotate down while they still have Baron for a little while. I wish they would hover one of them so we could see the Baron timer. Um, but while they still have Baron, why not escort these minions as far in the lane as possible, create as deep a pressure as possible. This is plenty forward for mid to where we could then follow right back through through the secured area to the dragon. Secure the dragon. And then since mid's going to push on its own from the super minions, just walk right back down after we get the dragon. Oops. Just walk right back down. And look. Just see if we can get it. Just look. No reason to fight here. See how defensive they're playing? They're all walking back right now. Even though they just got good poke. And these guys aren't necessarily going in. They're in a very defensive stance themselves. Why risk it? Just don't risk it. Let's all start retreating. Let's just stay back. We're not all here right now. To leave a little bit further out. Camille is splitting the top lane right now. And remember, she has Baron and what could be a super minion. That's a Baron empowered right now. Just let this push cost him. She, Kennen can't answer her. Kennen's pinned there. She's going to auto win that. All we got to do is stay back far enough to let these minions kind of push on their own from the Baron. Look at that. Ultimates are being used just to try and alleviate pressure. Not even successfully doing so. And Contracts, again, has to try to go in for like a hero play trying to insect. He almost finds it on Wild Turtle. Wild Turtle survives. And that's game. So clean. So clean. Oh my goodness, it was so clean. Look at that. Oh my god, the Bjorks in play at the end. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Well, he's going to make it out with his life, but that's game. Didn't even need to go back to the dragon. That is such crisp execution by TSM. Such good play. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, TSM. What a game. What a game. And what a game to open up the series, too. What is that final score? 1-16, in 16, I think it was. Yeah, at the very end of the game, I mean, they even Weaver's Wall, go back, go back, get away from my face. Look at this, they even Weaver's Wall at the very end to block them and trap them in their fountain. Look at the mind games, man. You don't have to do that. You didn't have to get these last two kills. But this is the first game of the series mind games that are coming out. They're bringing the noise. They're coming to hurt you. And they're successfully doing it. <laughs> This is, this is a game that you just got to relax, put it out of your mind, going into the second game is Cloud9, and just be like, all right, it's fine, we lost that first game, whatever, it doesn't matter, we're going to come back with the second game. And that's what we're going to hop into here after a short break. We're going to go into the second game, see what happens, see if Cloud9 goes down two games, or if they can even out the series and get a nice fresh reset, start for a best of two. We'll find out soon, but right now, we're on a break.